Welcome everyone to the Southwest Virginia Museum Historical State Park Master Plan public input meeting. That's a lot to say. And I appreciate everyone here tonight and this afternoon. This is a big crowd. Thank you all for coming. My name is Kelly McClary. I am the Director of Planning Recreation Resources for the Department of Conservation Recreation. This is the second of two meetings. So some of you, I see some familiar faces from the last time we were here. I wanna give you a little bit of background of what today is. So the last time if you attended was the public information meeting. So at that meeting, we talked about a lot of items, a lot of information for background about state parks, background for this park, as well as inf information regarding um, invasive species, cultural information. Today, what's different about this meeting, and you were able to provide some input with a survey that we had last time. This meeting, the difference of this meeting is today we have a proposed, proposed development plan that are both outside. If you saw the master plan um, boards that are outside, they're also going to be on this presentation today, so you won't have to go run outside to look. Um, we're going to talk about developing this park for the next 30 years. We're going to ask you to provide even more input. So if you provided input the last time, we're going to ask you in the next 30 days to provide us more input as to what you see today, what you have been seeing here in the future and in the past. And we would love any information you can provide us. Today here with me, we have a few people, so I'm going to introduce them and I'm going to let them get on with the presentation. So with me is Dave Collette. He's um, the Western Field Operation Manager, and he's going to be speaking to you today. Sharon, I know, is in the back because she's always amongst you guys. So Sharon Buchanan is in the back and is has been here at the park for so many years, I can't count. <laughs> But she certainly is the district manager of this area. Gretchen Cope, the park manager, is with us today, and you're going to be hearing from her. David Bryan, parks planner, is also with us in the front. And Samantha Wainsgard, um, planner for Par the recreation resources, will be here today. So thank you again for joining us, and welcome. Gretchen. Good afternoon. It makes me so happy to see everyone here. So thank you so much for coming out to support the park. We just really appreciate you taking time out of your day to do that. And I am Gretchen Cope. I'm the park manager here. We're going to get started with just a few housekeeping items. If you haven't already, if you could please silence your phones. I see a few of you reaching, so always good to check. Thank you very much for that. If you need restrooms, they are out in the hall. If you could please hold any questions or comments until the end of the meeting, we have set some time aside to do that. Also, this presentation will be recorded and it'll be available on the Parks Master Plan website so you can view it after the fact. So if you need that link or have any questions about that, just, just let us know. As you can see by looking at this agenda, it's, it's very full. We've got a lot of information to cover, but it's all good information. I think it'll you'll see it as time well spent. I won't read through the whole thing because that would take up too much time and you'll you'll gather it as we as we move through the process. Now I'm gonna go through the meeting purpose here and really we'll start with just sharing the process and the objectives, what we've been working on. We'll summarize and report on the input that we've received up to this point. Then we're gonna talk about the key elements of the overall master plan and kind of what, what we'd like to see. We'll point out some items on the map and then we'll roll into the opportunity for public comment, like I mentioned earlier. I'll turn it over to the Western Field Operations Manager, Dave Collett. Do I need to hold it? It records for the Okay. Uh, my name is Dave Collett. I'm the Western Field Operations Manager for Virginia State Parks. And I uh, just uh, want to thank everyone for coming out today. It's a very proud and humbling moment for me to be standing up here in front of you. I started out years ago, 30 plus years ago, as a wee park ranger here at Southwest Virginia Museum. Uh, this was my first full-time uh, position. So to stand up here after 30 some years and be part of the master planning process is just, uh, it's an awesome experience, let me tell you. But what also I see out there of looking at everybody is a sense of community and sense of place we have here that you guys took time out of your busy day 
uh, at three o'clock in the afternoon to come visit. And uh, we attend, as Kelly uh, and Gretchen talk about, we attend a lot of these meetings. And I can say without a shadow of a doubt, the last meeting I've been to in the last year, there's more folks in here today uh, than most, the vast majority of our public meetings. So thank you very much. But uh, Kelly mentioned that we have 42 state parks uh, and it has been a, it has been a hundred years in the making. Almost a hundred years ago in a couple of years, uh, folks first started talking about um, a state park system. We were the first system in the country to open an entire system all on the same day, uh, 1936. So we're very proud of that, of that fact. But we have grown since that time because the communities have dictated it. Uh, this, this community is one of many. It's, you're a backbone, you're a pillar of the park, uh, of the community, and, and we're proud of that. We've got a lot of folks right now that uh, we have parks that are that we've purchased the property and believe it or not that is the easiest part of the entire process is buying the land getting uh, getting the community support getting the resources to develop and start building facilities and everything those are where the challenges come from but we we know that we have good examples out there in, across state parks uh when we talk about uh, community friends groups and investment and and things like that Southwest Virginia rises to the top. Uh, being, uh, I'm proud of the fact that I'm a Southwest Virginia native. I grew up just up the river here down in Scott County on the Clinch. Uh, folks, it's a special place. And thanks for being part of this today. We look forward to hearing uh, your input after you hear the presentation today. And as always, I'm down out here a lot. I see Gretchen all the time, Sharon and everything. If you have anything that you'd like to talk to me about the museum, or anything in state parks, conservation field, just please let me know, but thank you. So I'm gonna turn it over to my next person on the list, uh, Samantha Wainsgard. She's gonna talk to you about um, the process. All right. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave, and everyone else that came before. Um, so as many of you may be aware, we did start this uh, the public input process last April. Um, so I'm here tonight to kind of talk about what we did to initiate that April meeting, but what we've done in between April 2023 and this afternoon's meeting. Um, just to start that off, if I can make sure I have the pointer in the right direction. Um, everything we've done is based on the State Park Master Planning Code. Um, for those that aren't familiar with it, the code does require that we go through a master planning process um, that includes public input um, and several steps in there um, to, to gather that input. Um, and that input from you all, as well as the work we've done internally over the last almost 12 months, um, will help inform how the park is um, looked at in the future and um, the development goals and the different opportunities that we have. And um, the project objectives themselves talk about uh, the existing conditions and looking at um, the different contexts in the park and the community. So we asked you all uh, for your feedback as part of that last meeting, as well as um, a public input survey that thank you all so much for um, submitting um, responses, whether it was here at the museum or online. Um, we got a lot of useful information from everyone um, to help inform the work that we did to get us here tonight. And based on what we present tonight, you'll have another opportunity to tell us what we got right and what we might need to um, look at again from that public input. Um, oops, and I skipped. Um, that overall process and the information that goes into that, we've broken it up into basically two different stages based on state code. Um, where we're at, we've already gone through the stage one, which was evaluation of existing conditions and doing a needs assessment both internally and externally. And I'll go over the results of those needs assessments here in a couple minutes. Um, and then our master plan recommendations. So based on the input we got from those needs assessments, uh, we put that information together um, to present to you all tonight. And again, it'll be an opportunity for you all to provide feedback. Um, and we'll use that feedback to move forward with the final master plan development. Um, as part of the work that we did, um, again, looking at what information you all gave us, um, we came, um, we developed a park 
purpose statement. Um, each park has a purpose statement and David Bryan will talk a bit more about the process that we came to to develop the park's purpose statement. Um, but the purpose of the Southwest Virginia Historic State Park is to collect, preserve, share, and interpret the history and culture of the Commonwealth's far southwestern coal producing counties, sustain connections with the surrounding local communities, and promote a sense of regional identity. So we feel like a lot of what we've put together tonight, again, with your input, is reflective of this purpose. And we welcome your input. Um, again, David will talk a bit more about how that process came to be and how this park um, purpose um, statement fits into the overall direction that we'll use um, with the master plan. Um, we also develop goals for the park. So each state park has a series of goals and objectives to help guide um, the park. And in regards to um, Southwest Virginia, we have um, six, identified six goals. I'm not gonna read through each one of these, but some of the highlights here are protecting and preserving um, the cultural and historic and natural resources, welcoming and safe place for all, um, a range of opportunities for folks to engage at the park, um, interpretation, benefits to not just the park, but also your the community you all, and doing that in a professional and transparent manner. Um, and again, David Bryan will also talk a little bit more about the desired visitor experience. There's a lot of words up here, so I'm not gonna read through each of them, but one part that we wanna make sure is emphasized in our master planning efforts is the visitor experience. What are you all looking to gain from your visits to the park and how can we um, vision the master plan to be able to meet those needs? Um, we also looked at the, um, the vicinity of the area. We did a number of um, evaluations of what's going on at the park, but as also in the surrounding context of Big Stone Gap in the region. Um, and we, this is the existing conditions that we have um, associated with the park um, as it is today. And we also took a look at a market analysis. So looking at um, both the one and the three hour drive shed for the park um, to kind of see what kind of trends that were occurring um, both locally and regionally. Um, and some trends in outdoor recreation we also looked at. Um, these are highlighted in a number of different publications, but talking about the value of leisure, recreation facilities, um, the audiences, and um, outreach. Uh, we also did a service level provider analysis. I'm not sure who will, all we have here tonight, but we did do outreach to both tourism and economic development, as well as a, a couple of the surrounding museums. Um, our needs assessment that I mentioned before um, talked about um, different ways that we had stakeholder input. Those included a, the hybrid public meeting last April, the respondents, and looking at the priorities that came from that input. Um, the public comment survey looked at reasons for visiting. Number one was events, and we had the exhibits. Some other highlights included the events, um, as well as favorite parts of the museum. Again, highlighting our wonderful staff we have here. Um, and reasons for returning, including events, general interest, and exhibits. Least favorite parts, and um, just a second, excuse me. I apologize. Um, for our public uh, comment survey, we looked at the least favorite parts of the experience, and I just left the clicker over there. Um, could you? Sorry. Um, we also looked at different areas because we don't want to just emphasize the positives. We also want to look for areas that may need improvement, including um, funding um, and staff, looking at our topics and subject matter, matter areas, um, as well as the exhibits. And um, there was a, a, a part of the feedback that also talked about um, the special events that the museum hosts. 
Um, we also, as part of the needs assessment, uh, utilize the Virginia Outdoors Plan. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with the Virginia Outdoors Plan, it um, helps guide our master planning process and is conducted every five years. Um, we're looking at the next one coming out here in the spring of 2024. Um, and some of the information that was used to help develop that um, Virginia Outdoors Plan, including the Virginia Outdoors Survey Report um, of results, those results will also help inform uh, the master plan for Southwest Virginia because there's a lot of good information that came out of that. And once it's uh, publicly available, uh, we hope to include it in the master plan to help identify the needs for the park and how they can be met. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and hand it off to David Bryan. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is David Bryan, State Parks Planner for Virginia State Parks. Uh, good to see everyone. Nice to have a full house. Um, I work as part of the resource management team at Parks, so we cover natural, cultural, and physical resources, as well as uh, GIS and data. Um, but today I'm, I'm going to fill in sort of for a, a team that I work with a lot, and that's our visitor experience team uh, at State Parks. Um, so the visitor experience is really all about you all and what you all experience at the park. Um, it really wraps up a lot of our education efforts, our interpretive efforts, and then since this is a very education-focused park, these discussions are really important. The first thing we're going to talk about a little bit more, and Samantha mentioned it, is our, our, mission, our mission or purpose statement. Um, you know, if you go back into some of the old master plans for Virginia State Parks, we have a lot of very generic uh, purpose statements, and one thing we're trying to really work on is to really dig into what's the heart and soul of this park. You know, and so there was a lot of discussion uh, among staff and various members uh, about this statement that was developed. And I'll just read it again. The purpose of the Southwest Virginia Museum Historical State Park is to collect, preserve, share, and interpret the history and culture of the Commonwealth's far southwestern coal producing counties, sustain connections with surrounding local communities, and promote a sense of regional identity. So this is what, you know, these statements don't happen overnight. We, we put a lot of work into this, but obviously welcome y'all's input. But I like to focus on the seeds in this thing. So collect, you know, the collection is really, you know, the heart and soul of this park. It, you know, when you come and you enjoy the park, you, you know, go to the museum to the various levels, you're going to see a, a, a small amount of what's in the collection from a thimble to the train car, as Burke likes to say, wherever he is. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, the collection is really what brings life to the, to the park. Um, we see culture. It, th that collection is showing forth the, the culture of Southwest Virginia uh, and beyond. Um, the coal producing counties, this is where we're centered. This is the history we're trying to tell. Connections, you know, y'all are evident, y'all are evidence to the connection that this park has with the community. It's nice to see everyone out here today. Um, but connections with the community is a, is a huge part of what this park is. Um, there's a lot of parks that we have in our system where, you know, a lot of the visitors are out of towners coming in, you know, to enjoy camping or hiking or what have you. You know, this park, is, it's amazing to come here and see how connected the community is. All right. Additionally, we had a few themes. Now, some of this was already was worked on a little bit earlier uh, when it was some of the um, work for future exhibits. Um, but the central theme of the park is endlessly entwined rivers, mountains, and human hands have carved a landscape of hope, home, and diverse culture that continues to reach far beyond Southwest Virginia. You know, we really wanted to focus on, you know, the human hands and hearts that really shaped this place, the, the, the museum itself, the park, the uh, town of, you know, Big Stone Gap, as well as the region. Um, all the artisans and all the amazing work they've done. You know, this this very building is evidence of that in terms of the craftsmanship and the woodworking and the stoneworking and so forth. Uh, we also think about all the music. You know, that's the music is a major part of this park. You know, both with you know the um, the festivals and everything else that happens here, as well as the education for you know uh, kids for uh, with different musical instruments. It's a landscape that provides, uh, you know, not only, you know, the coal that we've mentioned already, but also, you know, forestry products, agriculture, um, and those products in terms of culture like music. Uh, the culture and history of Southwest Virginia Museum and the, the museum itself um, is certainly a theme as, as it's where it's all centered. All right, we also wanted to talk about audiences. So, 
every single park, you know, Dave mentioned we've got over 40 state parks uh, from, you know, False Cape all the way on the Atlantic Ocean uh, to Wilderness Road out in far southwest Lee County. Um, every single park uh, attracts different groups of folks. Some of them have a very close knit community like this one. Other parks, again, we see folks coming from far out of town, out of state, and so forth. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out who are the primary users of Southwest Virginia Museum Historical State Park. And so this is what we came up with, sort of as a high-level umbrella. So we have our story-based users. You could also call these theme-based users that come to the park for a very specific reason. Experiential education. These are the people that come to the park to learn something. They want to, maybe they have some genealogy that they're tracing that runs through Big Stone Gap or Southwest Virginia, or Southwest Virginia and they want to come to the museum to see if they can find any more clues. Um, maybe they're just interested in, in old coal stories. Maybe they're interested in forestry. Maybe they're interested in African American or Native American history in the area. Um, whatever the case may be, they're here to learn something specific. They're searching something out. Um, and I'm going to skip to that third bullet for a second. We also have curriculum-based users that are usually here as part of an education requirement. So it might be a Boy Scout group or a Girl Scout group coming in to, to do something or go through a program to get a badge. Maybe a homeschool class coming in. Uh, maybe Retha is taking a, a program out to a, a local elementary or middle school. We also have our cultural recreation users. These are the folks that are really here for our festival. So they want to come see the, the quilt show. Or they want to come for Festival of the Trees. They want to come for Gathering in the Gap. And that's sort of their main time when they come to the park. And some of them come year after year after year uh, to enjoy it. Uh, and then our next uh, sort of group was our facility-based users. You know, most of our parks have this. These are the folks that come sort of to use the park as a means to an end. So maybe they're getting married. They want a really nice place. And they have some roots here in Big Stone Gap. And they're like, you know, I'd really love to get married at the museum out on the rail car lot. Um, maybe they want a family reunion and they do that. Maybe they just want to, some, you know, some girls want a girls weekend. They want to rent the Poplar Hill Cottage and explore Southwest Virginia that weekend. Um, so they're using the facility, maybe not here specifically to learn anything. Hopefully they learn something while they're here. Um, but, uh, they come to enjoy. And then, uh, Taurus. Uh, so I would say probably this, this park, maybe more so than most of our other ones, it's right here on the main drag. Um, and so people come in to the front door, you know, what's this big, neat old house about? You know, where's the local Walmart? What's the best recommendations that you've got for food? You know, that type of thing. Um, and some of our other parks that have a main road going through them get stuff like that too, but um, it's maybe not as usual. The key here is that every audience is unique. And when we talk about visitor experience and, and what we want to provide to you all as the guests of the park, um, we're trying to figure out what does every... Uh, type of guests, you know, want, what do they need, what do they expect? There's certain things that are shared from every group. Everybody expects to have clean restrooms, uh, but there's certain groups that are coming in and they want to learn something. Others want to experience something. And uh, so anyway, we break that down. All right. Next thing I'm going to talk about briefly is experience areas. So once again, no surprise, this park is very unique. Typically, when we talk about experience areas in Virginia State Parks, um, what, we're, what we're thinking about, or, or, you know, you may have one area of the park that's really geared towards day use visitors. So, you know, maybe there's a, a public beach, um, maybe there's lake access. Then we have another area of a park that's, you know, really for the overnight users, campgrounds, cabins, and that type of thing. And a lot of our parks are specifically designed to split those users up. Uh, to avoid user conflict, you know, some folks really love the busy beach atmosphere and other people just want that quiet cabin that's to be left all alone. And we want to, you know, make sure that both of those guests get what they're looking for. Um, so some of our parks, and I'll, you know, I'll just use an example down the road, you know, natural tunnel, you've got a day use area. A lot of people go into the visitor center and they'll go down and explore the tunnel, um, but they'll never go up to, you know, drive back to the cabins. They have no need to drive back to the cabins and that's, that's on purpose. Um, here at the museum, it's a little bit different. So the way we broke it down is that the core of the, of the museum, the sort of the core experience area is inside the stone walls. So inside the stone walls is where this very building is you know, located. It's also where the, the um, collection is held you know, in, the, in the old carriage house. Um, it's where the Victorian gardens that are pictured here is. You know, this is where folks can just come, relax, maybe have a picnic, enjoy the birds, the flowers, depending on the season. Our secondary area is the rail car lot in the Poplar Hill neighborhood. Now, obviously, portions of the Poplar Hill neighborhood are part of the park. Portions of them aren't. Some of you might be neighbors that live in the Poplar Hill neighborhood. Um, and people that aren't familiar with sort of the ins and outs of who is owning what property, it's all works. It's all one neighborhood to them. 
They're going to go on a walk and enjoy the whole thing. Um, but next, this is sort of interesting for us. We thought the next experience area really is the town of Big Stone Gap. Um, the park and the town are so intricately connected um, that, you know, that is where the the park benefits from the from Big Stone Gap and Big Stone Gap benefits from the park. Uh, and the two are really inseparable in terms of festivals and events and bringing education out to the local library and schools and that type of thing. And then broader uh, Corton area would be the local region with all of the surrounding counties. Okay. I think this is my last slide. We'll talk about a little bit about essential experiences. So the way I like to describe this is that if uh, if someone sees, you know, Burke is outside walking down the road you know, on the sidewalk here and they're like, that guy looks like a park ranger. I need to talk to that guy. And I need to, you know, I wasn't really planning on stopping into this place, but I got about half an hour or an hour. Maybe I can ask him what, what I can do and, and really enjoy this park really quick. I don't have a lot of time. But what are the essential experiences that are really helped me understand sort of the character of this park? Um, some of our parks, it's really easy. You know, natural tunnel, you ask a park ranger, hey, you got, I've got an hour and it's in the summer and they got that chairlift going. Well, we'll put you on the chairlift and send you down the mountain and go see the tunnel. Your natural bridge, we send people to natural bridge. High bridge trail, we send them to the high bridge at Camp Paradise. Down here, um, you know, it's a little bit different, this park. So one of the things we highlighted as an essential experience is opening the front door on the main floor and coming in for the first time and seeing the amazing woodwork, you know, seeing the, that staircase that goes up to the next floor. Um, it, it just is a wow moment. And I'm sure the folks that are at the front, uh, at the desk up there get a lot of wows when people walk in for the first time. You know, and every time I think it's amazing, but the first time, it, that's sort of the, it's really cool. Um, you know, this is the oldest continuously run museum west of Roanoke uh, in Virginia. Uh, so, I mean, that, that in and of itself, we want people to spend time in the museum, explore all the floors, immerse themselves in the collection. Um, if they get lucky, if that person that was driving by and sees Burke, uh, you know, is lucky, maybe they'll be here for the quilt show, Festival of Trees or something else, another event, Hoots and Haints, um, something else that's going on. Um, Maybe if they have a little bit more time on their hands, maybe they'll do a little bit of museum tour and they find out that, you know, Retha is, is leading a bus tour that afternoon. They're like, you know, I think I'll make some time. Maybe there's some opportunity for me to hop on and, and learn something about the region. Um, so that's another essential experience that we think everybody should, in time, at least do once. Um, music events, we've talked about that already. And then um, also, you know, People want to know what's Big Stone Gap. You know, where is the Big Stone Gap and that type of thing. We can send them over to the rail car lot. They can see that really neat train car, but they can also literally see the gap from there and get that experience. So again, these are the things that we're digging into. Um, so what we're going to transition is, so I'm going to take a step back for a second. When we start our planning process, we start with our resources, our natural and cultural and physical resources. Then we start thinking about our audiences and how we can best serve you as a critical part of the community. And then we start thinking about where we want to go. You know, what, what are the development pieces that we need uh, to make this park function? You know, what, are, what staffing do we need to, to operate on a daily basis? So I'm going to turn it over to our park manager, Gretchen Cope, and she's going to get into that. Thank you, David. So he's right. First, we start with where we are now, and then we talk about where we're going to get. So we've talked about visitor experience some, and now we're going to go into the existing park amenities, what we have here right now. So of course, we have the Southwest Virginia Museum itself, including the gift shop and the artisan gallery. We have various exhibits showcasing artifacts, and we have the basement meeting and program space, which of course we're utilizing right now. We have the Victorian gardens and the rail car lot, which as David explained earlier, he painted a beautiful picture of how the different areas of this park are utilized. And we have several programs, events, weddings, similar rentals all throughout the year. The rail car itself, which is situated on the lot and is our largest artifact. And the Poplar Hill Cottage, which is our only overnight facility. Now, some of the supporting park amenities, of course, is the carriage house pictured here, which we currently utilize for collection storage. We have an administrative office with a small meeting space. Some of the locals probably know that as the Miller House. That's how we refer to it. The park manager's residence. There are multiple sheds and buildings that we try to kind of make a maintenance area out of. 
and what we refer to as the ball and the leech lots. We'll pull up a map in a minute and I'll kind of point all this out. And again, we have maps in the hall. We can, if you have questions afterward and want to go over that, I'd be more than happy to do that. And then we have general parking in front of the museum along Wood Avenue. Now the fun part, the proposed amenities. So we are looking for a new or renovated administrative office just to better fit the, our needs. Our collection storage facility, we're currently using the carriage house, but the space just isn't adequate. We have a very large collection and in order to be able to properly store that, we really need more space. A comfort station, which is just a restroom, but we, we need an, a restroom facility exterior to the museum because of access reasons. We can't have ADA compliant restrooms in this facility. So having something external would supply that ADA compliance while also giving us just more restroom facilities to support the amount of people that we have coming to the park. We need exterior lighting improvements there, which any of you who have been to an evening program here are well aware of. And then general parking. We have very limited parking here. We, we make use of what we've got. We use the ball lot pretty regularly for overflow parking, but we plan on making some improvements there as well. And we really need a maintenance facility. So we're looking forward to that. As far as renovations and updates, um, we talked about the ball lot and the parking there. We just wanna make some improvements to that lot so they can better hold up to the vehicle traffic on it. And accessible parking, we, we only have one accessible parking space right now. We really want to, to do better in that area. And we need to make, if we were to acquire or build another collections facility, we would make improvements and renovations to the carriage house so that we could be able to utilize that space for programming, workshops, collections, workspace, that kind of thing. And the Poplar Hill Cottage just needs some, some simple renovations. Under other, we have an accessibility study. I mentioned ADA compliance a couple of times just with this slide up, and it's something we really want to focus on. But with historic buildings, we need to see where we can make those changes to be you know, within compliance. And then some landscaping improvements, and then mechanical and utilities just to keep up with the, the changes and the growth within the park. Now the site design and park layout. I know this map is hard to see. Um, I'll just kind of hit the high points and then I'll be in the hall after this meeting to talk about the map so we can go over everything there. Um, I've got a little laser here. I'm, it's so small, I'm not sure if anybody can even see it, but I'm still gonna use it and hope that you can. So over here in the, I'll just use my finger. I'll just step over here. There is, both of the maps that you saw coming in are the two maps we have mm -hmm. in the presentation as well. So this is what we refer to as the ball lot, which um, we're currently utilizing for parking and we plan to continue to do so. When I talked about those improvements to the lot, what I was talking about were just permeable pavers. It's something we'd put down, grass would go through and it would still look like a field, but it would hold up well to cars driving on it. Um, over here, what we refer to as the leech lot is the future site of where we hope to build our maintenance area. And we have the, the rail car a lot and the rail car itself. We hope to expand lighting in that area. This is where our administrative office is currently and we hope to make some improvements there into the cottage. Between the two is where we think we can expand on our handicap parking. And over here on the museum, the, the biggest changes are expansion of lighting and then bring a path through here to where we hope to build our comfort station over there just off to the side of the museum. And then we have the um, park residents across Wood Avenue. Again, I know the map is small and it's, it's hard to see, but I'll be in the hall afterward and, and happy to go over anything. And I know we've talked about a lot of changes and a lot of improvements, but those it, it couldn't all be done in one fell swoop anyway. So we've worked these into phases, trying to prioritize what we hope to be done, what we hope to accomplish. So in phase one, we have the maintenance facility, which I mentioned previously, we hope to build on what we refer to as the leech lot. And we'd like to improve accessibility, expand on exterior lighting and add that comfort station. Phase two, we would like to build or acquire um, a larger and appropriate collection storage facility. And after that's done, we want to convert the carriage house to classrooms and collections workspace and we need to make some improvements to our administrative office. 
And then in phase three, that's when we've worked in the Poplar Hill Cottage renovations and the ball lot renovations. Now the staffing needs, we work these into phases as well. Over here on the far left where it says immediate, these are positions that are identified currently as needs that we have in the park. And that would be an assistant park manager that focuses on administration and special events. Those of you that are familiar with the park are aware of how many large events we have here. So being able to apply a focus on that would, would help greatly. Also a, a chief ranger that would be able to focus on collections and be the primary collections manager as well as an education specialist and a park ranger with a focus on historic maintenance and then three wage staff. In phase one, we have another park ranger with a focus on historic maintenance and that falls into phase one and fits in nicely with the um, addition of the maintenance facility. And in phase two, we've got the addition of an office assistant, an education specialist and a park ranger that would assist the the chief ranger that focuses on collections. All of that falling in with the improvements to the administrative offices, as well as changes to collections management and a new collection storage facility. And then a volunteer coordinator and two wage staff. And I know that um, some of these are not typical park position titles that we see. And we've got things in parentheses, like it says park ranger, but then it says historic maintenance. And as David talked about when he was up here, this park is really unique. And so we tried to take all of that into consideration when we were putting this information together. That way it, it is a park ranger, but it's suitable for this site because there is a heavy focus on historic maintenance. And now I'll turn it back over to Samantha for the timeline. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, so, as you've heard from everyone, we've talked about how we got to where we're at, where we want to go, and how we're going to get there. Um, tonight is another step in that process, um, but we do have a few more to go. Um, after tonight, we will have a 30-day comment period for public comment, and we will take that information to help draft that master plan, um, which we hope to present to the Board of Conservation and Recreation um, this fall. Um, following that, we will have the final adoption in the winter of this year, and then looking at that broad horizon with each of those phases that Gretchen just reviewed over a 30-year time period. Um, so the big things that are coming up are getting your feedback on all the information we just presented and helping put that into the, the final master plan that will go before the BCR um, and um, be adopted down the line here, hopefully by the end of 2024. Um, with that being in um, mind, again, next steps, uh, we have that public comment um, through March 22nd. Um, so that's 30 days. By no means does that mean March 23rd, you're like, oh no, I haven't submitted my comments. Um, we have the, um, the web page here, as well as um, an email that I'll put up on the screen after the slide. Um, any and all comments are welcome. We'll also have the remainder of tonight's meeting open for comments from folks, um, whether formally as part of um, the discussion or afterwards amongst staff. Um, but we will have that opportunity. And once the master plan is approved, it will also be put up on the web page here and the web page is kind of used as our project page. If you all have questions or comments or want to reach out to us or just want to look at something before you do reach out to us. Um, so with that being said, we'll give the opportunity at this point in time for public comment and discussion. Um, I have a, a, we have a microphone that we can send around and we have staff available to answer anyone's questions. Um, I would be the big mouth. Uh, the, que the question I have is, did you say a 30 year, a 30 year timeline for these things to be implemented? Yes. Um, we generally look at things in a 30 year horizon um, and we update them per code. We look at them each 10 years. So that all the things that you had presented wouldn't happen in 10 years. They would happen over a 30 year period. 
that is the intention, but each everything is dependent on funding. So we look at things with the the goal of a 30 year build out, but everything is dependent on funding. So if everything were to be able to be funded, that would be the anticipation is 30 years. But that's also why we look at things every 10 years to help update. And I see Kelly is moving over towards the mic to help expand upon that. I have to remember, we have to talk into this so the people online can hear it as well. So even if it's a 30, that's our 30 year time frame. If we have all the funding next year, we can build it all within five years. So it's not about, it's just about projecting. We're required to do a master plan update every 10 years. If we haven't done anything in 10 years, we'll be looking at the same information and be reiterating and, and regurgitating it back to you and making sure it's still what the plan is. That does not mean we have to do it in 30 years. We just project what it would take in 30 years. Like yeah, I know. I know. That's why I wanted to expand on the question, because I don't want you to feel defeated and think we're never getting this done in my lifetime. That's not the case at all. Um, it doesn't have to be the case. So I always say to a group like this, because you guys are a great community, you guys can help us. Um, in order for us to get funding, we go to the General Assembly with capital requests each year. Those capital requests actually follow the master plan process. So once the master plan is adopted, we actually use the master plan in these phases to request funding. Usually what we'll do is start with the phase one, but sometimes we've requested the entire master plan. Does not mean we'll get funding but it is has potential too. So delegates, local representatives of the area, the more um, you can help us to ask those questions and, and make it important to those people, the, the better we can get funding for each of the parks. Hopefully that answers that question. Ballpark in today's dollars, if we wanted the whole thing done, how much money would we need? Do we have big the, guess? We have not fit. So at the end of this process, we'll have that cost for you. We don't so, have the cost right this second, but that's only because we haven't finalized the process yet. So once we're done with this planning process, meaning the next six months, stay tuned. And we'll, when we have this plan in place, we'll actually have the cost for each phase and then the total of the cost. But we just haven't done that yet. Could you be more specific about what improvements to the ball lot you are going to make? It, what I mentioned with the permeable pavers. Is that it? Yeah, and there will be no pavement or anything like that. Um, I know we utilize it for parking, but we also want to keep in mind the aesthetic of the neighborhood and that we're in a historic setting. So, yeah, permeable pavers are great. They go in and grass grows through. You won't really know that they're there, but we also won't make a big muddy mess. Um, yeah. Thank you. On the on the general parking, where you were saying that you wanted to expand general parking, where would you expand? Those improvements to the ball lot. The ball lot. Did yeah, that's the general. Yeah, but we don't really have anywhere else to yeah, expand out from that. Right now, we do utilize, as you know from today, we utilize the rail car lot for that as well, but not as heavily as we do the ball lot. Um, and then, of course, with the handicap parking, we want to make some expansion there as well. Some uh, good news from the town side. Um, some of you remember that we applied for some VDOT money uh, about five years ago, and uh, that's actually been moved up to 25, 26. So there'll be a sidewalk that connects the park coming up by the library and up to the museum. So uh, it's moved up to year 25, 26. So as this stuff is going on, that's another way of uh, connecting to, and of course you connect to the park, you connect to the green belt, and uh, that's another thing that I think some way we can add into the master plan to show that the town and the museum are working together. We always like good news, Steve. So if you can help us to show us where you're showing, we will show that on our master plan and we'll either show it by others or that intention so that it's also captured in the language. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
I, I promise, I promise we will know. I just don't know today because what we need, the reason why I don't know today is because you guys have not agreed with our plan today. So we've proposed these things. We want your input to say, yes, we like everything that you guys put set out to do, or yes, we like it, but we also would like this, this, and this. Once that information comes to us, then we actually start estimating. So I promise you, it's not that we're not going to be transparent. We just don't have that today for you because right now we're just trying to figure out what is that development plan. We've proposed a plan for everybody. We just need you guys to say, hey, I love it or hey, I hate it. <laughs> uh, one thing the town can help with there too, uh, it's almost impossible to estimate that stuff now. When we did the bridge, the new bridge that goes over the river headed toward Appalachia, that was a $500,000 project before COVID. And it took us about $1.6 million to get it done. Yeah, costs are increasing for sure. Yeah, obviously the, uh, the history of this museum is in some way the history of my family. And so our interest in this is is high and very strong. And I guess my curiosity in listening to what you had to say was the one piece that seemed to be missing, and it may be just semantics and how it's being worded by you all, but the actual collections that are upstairs and changing all of this and updating all of the exhibits was not really identified as a primary part of what you all were talking about. And I guess at least for myself and my family, we have a very strong interest in the update of all of those exhibits, along with all of the other things that you've described, which are, we're very happy with and, and, and obviously will support. But I was curious about the, the updating of those exhibits. And that's definitely going to happen. It's just, you can really get down in the weeds on details with that. So it's not something that was worked into the larger overall master plan. But the visitor experience work that we did, which David um, did a great job of reviewing, that is kind of guiding us as we work on those exhibit documents and trying to get the information together for that. Sure. We used a lot of the work that we did through that visitor experience and the planning meeting that we did just to make sure that everything was kind of aligned with both the master plan process and the exhibit redo. Great. <laughs> and another component to that when we talked about it is the information that Gretchen is talking about, David having used, um, that was built off of the public information surveys. So the information that David and the internal group that put that together, it wasn't just based on what we think or what we want. It was all informed based on that public input. So if you put something in the public input about it, it was acknowledged, reviewed, and incorporated as part of our process. And I'm gonna expand on that a little bit because um, as David mentioned when he was going through the visitor experience section, he, he said that some of the information that we had was actually already gathered. That was gathered as part of the exhibit planning process because some work has already been done in that area. So actually some of the previous exhibit work guided us through this visitor experience planning process and it'll just continue to carry on. Uh, what about the accessibility to handicapped and elderly people to be able to get in? Is there anything, um, an elevator, uh, when I mentioned that um, the feasibility study or the accessibility study, that's something that we would have to have somebody outside come in and look to see what we can do because it's a, it's a historic structure. Right. So um, it's not something that I can look at and say, oh, we could do this. Um, and Kelly may be able to speak to that a little bit more, but um, that's exactly why we work that in because we want to be as accessible as we can, but we have to figure out where we can and what we right. can do. Is there anything you want to add to that? You know, that we agree. I mean, we're always looking for to expand the ADA accessibility in all of our parks, this one including. 
included. And so we'll use a study like that to allow that transparency as well. So that whatever we find, whether it's coming down here or sometimes it's changing where you're associating a room. And so we may have to look at it as a broader sense of, wait a minute, this is the gathering room in this building today, but maybe it makes sense for it to be somewhere else so that it makes it more accessible. None of those have been like looked at close enough yet to acknowledge what it is that we would have to do and what to present to the public and, and talk to you guys about basically. But yeah, we're open to any option that is available to us. And we're always trying to expand the accessibility to our parks. All right, well, um, I just had a question, excuse me, I've been very sick. <laughs> Um, if this plan is the time to ask about like if new additions and new buildings that are going to go up, if they will fit the aesthetic of the historic neighborhood, or if we'll be looking at a maintenance facility that looks like a typical maintenance facility. Well, I would, I will both probably in tandem. So anytime we do any facilities at parks, it's always the aesthetic of that park. That's the first and foremost. So even a maintenance area, we, especially in a place like this, that it's out in the open and we can't tuck it away like a traditional park where we're in a rural setting and we have a lot of trees and buffers that we can hide, maybe an ugly maintenance area. Well, that's because we have ability to hide it from the public. In an area like this where we would not have ability, we absolutely would be considering the outside aesthetic to the building and making sure it's in the historic context of everything else around it. But do you want to add that to it? I just wanted to add to say that we were very intentional with the language that we used when putting all of this information together to be sure to point out that any new facilities that were built or renovations that were made, changes that were made, would be sensitive to the just to the aesthetic of the neighborhood um, altogether. You know, when you think maintenance shop for a museum, I know you think of a, a block building and chain link fence, and that's obviously not what we want for this neighborhood. Um, and we were very specific with the language that we use, and everybody on, on the master planning team was, was great about understanding that. We were even specific with wording when we talked about lighting and the lighting that we added so that we didn't add a typical, you know, parking lot light fixture here in the Poplar Hill neighborhood. So we, we actually went to great lengths to try to be very specific with that wording because that also affects the cost. And we want to make sure we get that cost where we need it to be. Although I don't know what the cost is yet, Ida. It just went up 10 million. <laughs> but you know, it's, but it's important and we're, and we're aware of that. Anybody have any other questions? I think Ida does, Aretha. We haven't talked about the new internet access that we have. We have a collection of about how many items about in the 60, carriage house? 000, about 60,000. 60,000. Most of the, the comments we get when we're out in the community is, where's the captain's that old Mr. True used to demonstrate with. Where is so-and-so? Is there a way somewhere in this plan, even if you use volunteers, to take pictures of those items and have them on, at, accessible to people who want to know, do you have old guns? Could you use another spinning wheel? Do you have an antique so-and-so? Right now, what's in the collections might as well not exist because nobody can see it unless we do it. And I don't mean that as a criticism. It has to be temperature controlled and humidity controlled. We understand that. But is there a way that in that planning part, you can say, come in our attic, look in our attic album, and we will have even the photos. We have so many things that aren't in this plan, but cost a whole lot of money, but would add so much richness, not just to people here, there are people in Indiana, Ohio, Florida, you name it, we've out migrated to those places. And it would be great if they had a way to share in this experience. That's what the bus tour does. It is actually a museum without walls. You get on the bus and the museum takes you out to learn. Dr. Fleener does the narration for a lot of that. Takes you out to learn about why things matter here. So we really need something that helps people understand what's in that collection over there. It's not like 
47 saxophones that somebody might have played. It's really all kinds of neat and incredible stuff. I think that, that's a good question that um, is, we'll have several answers. Um, <laughs> well, it, <laughs> so there, there are a lot of questions, a lot of answers to that question, which may better be served in an actual conversation, but I'll, I'll do my best to answer. And if anybody else, Sharon, including you in the back, if you have anywhere to, to chime in, feel free. Um, I'll say that it, it's typical with museums that you, they don't put their entire collection on display at a time. And part of that is to keep things fresh. That way we can do rotating exhibits. We can add new exhibits and people come in and see things they've never seen before. So to some you know, extent with museums, that's intentional. Um, I will also say that you, you mentioned the sea captain's desk. This past year at gathering, we brought that out for gathering and it had been a long time since since some people had seen it, since anyone had seen it really. And, you know, on one hand, that's a drawback. Um, on the other hand, it gave people an opportunity to have this real emotional interaction when they saw this that they hadn't seen in years. And if it was here and they saw it all the time, they wouldn't really have that same reaction. It's kind of like McDonald's in the McRib. You know, you just pull it out every once in a while and, and get everybody excited. So we don't have a McRib, but we have a sea captain's desk. And I made everybody laugh so I can quit for the day. Um, but so so that's part of it. I'll also say that um, you mentioned volunteers and yes, it would take a you know enormous amount of people and work hours to be able to put something like that together when you look at how many artifacts that we have and to be able to make them available in that way. Um, and to that end, there's staff and there's just a lot that a lot that goes into that. We've made some efforts to do that, which um, like we have a, a computer available. We did for a while in um, the artisan gallery where people could come in and look at the images we have in the collection. They could purchase those. So we've made some efforts to make some more, you know, some more items available. And I think there's also a potential there when we look at the new exhibit design and what we may be able, be able to incorporate and the way that the technology is. I think that in itself will allow us to showcase more of what's in our collection, even if it's not an actual tangible item that we have out on the shelf, but a digital version. We'll just have to see what those plans look like once we start moving with those and get some actual concrete plans in place. So I hope that at least answers part of your question. Well, and that's actually some specific language that we've used in the documents that we have so far is that we don't want to get something that's like, you know, so much technology that it's outdated so quickly because that can easily happen. So we want something that's sustainable. Um, and that's, again, we've, we're have we very intentional and very specific with the language that we've used, not just in the master plan, but in the exhibit planning process to, to eliminate that very problem because that is a real problem that you see with, with museums. Mm-hmm. Do you have anything you want to add to any of that, Sharon? I have a gift occasionally. Sometimes. But we have an online question. That's what we say So question online, this is from Jenny Terman, and she says, along the same lines of creating new exhibits, I'm wondering if there's a way for the state park system to reach out to solicit input from younger area residents, high school and college students, 20 and 30 somethings, et cetera. Because if we're talking about a long range plan, it would also be good to get their ideas. Also, does the park have plans to open up the archives for public use and research? So, so if you saw me here last time, which I think it was 12 months ago or so, I asked everyone here to bring their children and bring their grandchildren. We want everyone to be part of the public comment, but we also surveyed outside of just this room. So we put surveys online. And so we are trying each time we do a master plan process to gain 
more users to gain different generations of users here, uh, children, school groups, those kind of users. So each time we do a master plan process, we're always trying additional outreach. Some of the ideas that we've been working with is community colleges. We haven't we haven't exactly figured out the right mix of how to make sure we get all the people we want to a public meeting. I think we talked last time about a night public meeting online. We've been doing a lot of these hybrid meetings. So right now we are actually online and that's where that question comes from. The good news is a lot of young people we all know are only on their phones. Well, now they have access to it where they're not gonna necessarily come out to this meeting today, but they have access to it on the online forum. Them. So those are some of the ways that we're trying to introduce additional people, additional generations. As you said, in 30 years, who do we need to make sure is at this meeting today so that in 30 years, someone holds me to it and I promise I finish all of this work, right, in the master plan process. So. I'll add to that, and um, specifically to you, Jenny, I, we can, uh, Burke and I, one of us, will send you the link to this because comments can be submitted until March 22nd. So Jenny or anyone else, if you guys want to, you know, get that link, you can send it out because um, we really do genuinely want to get that input. And it's not just specific to this master plan. If you have come out of this process and you're like, hey, I have an idea for how you could do additional outreach in the future, or maybe this is an area that we feel like you could expand upon. There's going to be other state park master plans and other state park master planning efforts. So we welcome your feedback, not just with Southwest Virginia and how we operated this process. So if you have ideas on additional ways that we can engage with different um, age groups or um, other ways that we break up the population in terms of who might come and how they might contribute. We certainly would welcome that, um, not just in this public comment period, but we also, um, the email that we've put up on, on the screen, as well as you'll see online, um, is open for um, not just Southwest Virginia Museum comments, but if you have comments on the general master planning process or how we're you know, engaging with different groups. Um, we check it. I'm the one that checks it. So <laughs> there's a person behind that email, I promise. So we appreciate your feedback. Are there any other questions? Can I do a couple shout outs? But thank you all for coming. I wanted to point out, we've got members from town council and the board of supervisors, town of Big Stone Gap, the Lone Pine Arts and Crafts, for central office and PRR. We've got people here from there. Um, Sharon, of course, and so many volunteers and people from the community. So we really appreciate you guys coming out to, to support the park. Really, really do. And please send in your input, any thoughts, questions, concerns. Um, me and other staff people will be around and ready to answer questions. I'm going to step out by the maps in case anybody has any questions about those. I know it was pretty hard to see on the screen. Oh, yes, thank you. And our friends group graciously provided refreshments for this afternoon. So if you haven't yet, please check that out because if there's anything our friends group is good at, it's feeding people. They love to do it. Um, so thanks to our friends group for offering that. And please grab some, grab some food.